launch pad at this time. Hello everyone and welcome back to Microsoft Flight Sim, where for the 40th anniversary of the first shuttle mission, I decided to fly around the world in the DC Designs F-15 while listening to the audio from the first shuttle mission, condensed to remove silences. So here we are taking off from Edwards Air Force Base before the launch, and uh, I didn't listen to the launch in real time, but I did listen to it on the correct days. So this is day one, or April 12th, and we were taking off from Edwards, and I was flying to Houston and then to Cape Canaveral, hoping to arrive at Cape Canaveral in time for the launch, so the audio we're listening to is the pre-launch audio. The plan, of course, was to land back at Edwards in time for the shuttle landing on Wednesday, April 14th, uh, which is, of course, the anniversary of the day they landed. The total flight time planned was about 22 hours, here I am landing at Ellington Field at Houston. This is where the astronauts fly their T-38s out of, and so it's appropriate. The video is the recording from the live stream, and so it's not as high quality as I was seeing it. Hopefully it's acceptable. If you wanted to see the entire flight uh, with all the audio and also the chat log, that's available as Twitch videos on demand on my channel. I'll link it in the video description. So there'll be three videos there. And so the next flight is from Ellington to the shuttle landing facility at Cape Canaveral. And here I'm taking off at Ellington Airfield. Obviously, because I want to present the entire around the world flight in this video, uh, things will be fairly tight and we can't get all the good bits in the audio or anything like that. I'm talking over it. Here's Houston downtown. I had a bit of photogrammetry problem initially, and so I wanted to take a look at, once again, flying over to see the photogrammetry was in a proper condition. And then there's the Mississippi Delta. This was a relatively short flight, and one of the caveats to all of this is that because the fuel consumption on afterburner isn't quite right, I can basically run at Mach 2.5 or 2.4, 2.5 the entire way without worrying about it. It doesn't hurt my range, which is great, but of course it's not exactly realistic, so forgive me. The drop tanks are not jettisonable as far as I know, so they'll be hanging out the whole way. I would have jettisoned them as appropriate otherwise, but we could not. At least I don't know of a way. Now, I am flying exceedingly casually during this live stream, so you'll have to forgive me. Uh, I'm a bit sloppy, as we can hear here. Ah, why am I off? Oh, well, that's part of the runway anyway. <laughs> I give up. I'm really heavy. It was feeling really ugly. It is true. It was very heavy because I had fully fueled, but the flight was only about less than half our total range. That flight was only 760 nautical miles, whereas this uh, proved its ability to fly more than 2,000. So, yeah. Anyway, on to Boston was our next destination. The first flight from Edwards to Ellington was 1,193 nautical miles and took an hour and six minutes. Oh, there's launch. Okay, well, so that was the launch, and here we're passing by the VAB. I'm cutting out some of the portions where I talk a whole lot, so that's why some of it... We're not getting necessarily the best shots of the buildings as I fly around Kennedy Space Center here, and... There's the shuttle building. Yeah, well, there's that, ki that kind of comment. Uh, well, that was unavoidable because we are right there. Anyway, so up I go and on to Boston. I plan to fly low at Washington, D.C. and New York along the way. Speaking of the view, the flight from Kennedy Space Center to Boston was 949 nautical miles and took 1 hour and 34 minutes, mainly because of the sightseeing. So here we are at uh, Washington, D.C. And again, the choice of shots is partly to work around the fact that I was talking at the time. 
so forgive me for that. Again, you can uh, see the entire video on Twitch. There's the capital. And on we go. Unfortunately, the weather was not always good. I had real-time weather even though I wasn't flying in real time. So the time of day is not in sync, but the weather is. And the weather at New York proved to be atrocious. Here's me descending into New York City. Yeah, it's, it's rainy, it's not being very conducive to sightseeing at the moment. I guess this must have been how it was. But there we are, that's, that's New York for you. A little bit dangerous flying fast here. So I wanted to avoid any incidents and departed post haste. It's nice ascending through the clouds with the F-15. Somebody had requested that I visit Plymouth Rock for some reason. Uh, all I could find was this pilgrim monument, so I decided to fly by it. That's a special site in the sim. So we, we hit that one, and on to Logan International. And this was the weather <laughs> facing me on the way into Logan. So, they got the SRBs, and, well, it wasn't too bad approaching the runway, but it wasn't great. We'll see worse. This is not the worst weather situation we face on final. Uh, but, yeah, that was pretty bad. Uh, yeah, that was just horrible. Nobody saw that. The perils of trying to fly while entertaining a Twitch audience. I, I blame my audience entirely, of course. Oh god! Oh god! Oh god! Don't do that! Don't do that! No! Bad plane! Bad plane! Okay, that was my fault. Shuttle control, Houston. Three hours and 27 minutes. Uh, that's a standing joke uh, between the uh, silver team of flight controllers and, Okay, got uh, it, got it, got it. Uh, Did I mention right, that uh, during live streams I fly exceedingly casual. Anyway, on from Boston. As long as the sim doesn't kill me, I figured it was legit. And uh, just a heads up, it doesn't actually kill me during at any point during this flight. I have the I have the live stream record to prove it. Everything was done legitimately. It never came up with the black screen saying that I died. So it's all legit. <laughs> it all counts. So on we go, this time to St. John's International, and if the weather was that bad at Boston, you know it's going to be horrible at St. John's. It pretty much always is. The clouds are nice and fluffy though, so there is that positive. The flight from Boston to St. John's is 834 nautical miles, and took 51 minutes. So here I am descending in, through the formidable layer of clouds. And rain. And this is what it looked like. Now I did have a moving map to work with, so I was basically landing with GPS. It's not like pure VFR or anything, though. I like that too. And there's the runway. Oddly, uh, this is a lot better than some of my other landings, even though it was a tough one to just sight the runway. I really didn't get a whole lot of lead time. But I'm also used to flying into St. John's for other flights, so... I knew some of the landmarks ahead of time. Next flight, I tried to cross the Atlantic direct instead of going to Greenland and Iceland, so we're trying to make it to Shannon in Ireland, and even though it didn't show uh, that I had the full range there, that was only with the 50% tank that it normally fuels things to. Getting off the ground with the full fuel load is actually a little bit difficult. And landing with any remaining fuel tends to be challenging. The, the stall speed of the F-15, at least this F-15, is pretty high when we have some fuel remaining. Uh, some well, significant fuel remaining, let me put it that way, like when I was landing at the Cape. It was really heavy at that point. Anyway, this is me landing at Shannon. It is nighttime at this point. 
I gave my audience the choice of whether I should advance time uh, for the next flight so that we see London at night or whether we see it in daytime and they chose daytime. So we I advanced time and we are taking off from Shannon in Ireland in daylight and on we're not gonna land in London we're gonna fly over London and Paris and land at Prague ultimately though I was debating various different locations to land at in Europe so this is the rapid descent into London and all thanks to the speed brake <laughs> it's very important to have that speed brake and so a few passes. I've got the Orbix London scenery. I turned off the photogrammetry because it was interfering with the Orbix scenery. I think there's been an update to the Orbix scenery that might address that. I don't know. I haven't tried it since that update. So just flying around, getting in the sights before I proceed on across the channel to Paris. Because I have the paywear scenery for London, I decided to make a number of passes to enjoy it while I'm here. And we'll also be hitting Moscow because I have uh, the Derzweki scenery for Moscow. Didn't want to miss those on my trip around. But on to, that's the River Seine there and Paris. Somebody wanted me to fly under the Eiffel Tower, you know, under the bottom bit of it, but I was making the case that actually I don't think I can fit under there. And I made a few passes to demonstrate that it might be dangerous, especially if the colliders were iffy. So here I go, taking a look at it. Anyway, taking a few other sights at uh, high speed around Paris. I made some dramatic dives around just for fun. Overall the handling of the F-15 was fine and very familiar to me, uh, but landing was a little bit tough though. That, that was, it's a little bit weird. It seems to have a very high stall speed when it comes down to landing. Here I was trying to take a look at Switzerland. We passed by Switzerland. I wanted to see mountains, but uh, the weather was not very conducive, so we're over the lower areas of Switzerland here. And I then proceeded to want to fly along the Danube. This is a nice uh, high altitude bit between Switzerland and the Danube, and then I would dip back down. And parts of the Danube were visible. This is uh, in Germany. This is pretty close to the source of the Danube. And so it's not a very large river at this stage. It gathers up tributaries along the way. Uh, but ultimately the clouds got in the way and made the sightseeing not very useful. So I decided to abort the following the Danube plan. And that probably would have ultimately brought us to Budapest or something like that. So yeah, this is what the Danube ultimately looked like and why I decided that following it wouldn't be such a great idea. So I went with Prague because somebody mentioned landing at Prague and I went with it. The weather wasn't great, but I could see the runway. And you can get, yeah, yeah, okay, there we go. That runway was actually X'd out, but it was a little bit too late for me to adjust for that. The next flight was a bit complicated. I decided I wanted to fly over Copenhagen, Stockholm, Helsinki, and P St. Petersburg on the way to Moscow. So it's a long flight. This is the wake-up call for STS-1 on the first, on the day two, sorry, on day two. That song was the wake-up call. It was a nice dawn takeoff from Prague. Even though I didn't actually plan for it ahead of time, it turned out that Berlin was on the way. So I got a look at Berlin after getting to altitude. There's a lot of getting up to altitude and then dipping down again that happens. So there's a quick, quick flyby of Berlin on our way to Copenhagen. I forget what the photo scenery condition of Berlin is. I don't know if they have uh, photogrammetry or not. So here is our dive into Copenhagen. 
and flyby of the airport and environs. I don't know any of the buildings in particular. Uh, there was an interesting one up ahead right there. And I do a quick ring around the city before proceeding on to Stockholm, where I did have one site that was plotted. I noticed that they had a special building, some sort of Ericsson globe. And so I aimed for that. Uh, we uh, cut the bridge between Denmark and Sweden right there. And then this was me diving into Stockholm to see the Ericsson globe there. That's that stadium-like thing, I guess. And this is a high view of Stockholm with all of its islands and a very busy sort of landscape. It's very nice. I like busy landscapes, of course. And then it was on to Helsinki in Finland. Uh, that looked like this in the sim at the moment. I just, I don't think so. I, that's my, that's a personal opinion. As we listened to yet another one of the press conferences that the mission control shifts did. Every shift they did a press conference. I think they were eight hour shifts. And inevitably it was always about the tiles on the Ohms pods that uh, were damaged. Anyway, this is uh, Tallinn in Estonia. And just a quick look at that. Oh. Camera pan, and we see the backward view. So that's Tallinn. And then on to St. Petersburg, where there was a particular site on the map. So one that came with the game, and I wanted to take a look at this Church of the Savior on Spilled Blood. Sounds interesting. Uh, so here's St. Petersburg, and I'm trying to angle myself towards the site so that we get a good look at it. Oh, is that, that, it's the, it's sort of like St. Basil's, not quite. No. I see it. Maybe this is an answer to it's that one there. Uh, the tiles came off, is there Vaguely the same okay. style. And Black Obelisk. <laughs> That's ominous. Indeed. So, yep, those were my comments at the time. And here we are approaching Moscow. And again, I have the Derzweki landmark pack for Moscow. And so I got a few looks at that, that tower there and many other buildings, lots of buildings that come with that pack. I've done a video on it separately, so you can take a look at that if you're curious, but I just wanted to enjoy it during this flight before proceeding onward. Since we hit some space locations in the United States, I wanted to also hit Baikonur after reaching Moscow here, so that's the next leg from Moscow to Baikonur. And we'll take a look at the Cosmodrome there and say make a final completely non-threatening pass at the Kremlin and then land at um, uh, UUDD I don't remember how to pronounce that airport <laughs> it's anyway uh, so so far uh, we had done day one this day two I didn't mention the distances from Ireland to Prague it was 1127 nautical miles plotted and from Prague to Moscow is 1,352 nautical miles. And here we're going from Moscow down to the Cosmodrome. And that is 1,105 nautical miles. So far we haven't really been pushing the range on anything except for the time when we crossed from St. John's to Shannon. And in all cases I've been carrying way too much fuel which has hurt my landing ability. But here we are, taking a look at the Cosmodrome. Very, very spread out and complicated landscape. Sometimes hard to figure out where things are. I really need a better map of the place. But, yep, we definitely see some launch pads and the really, really long tracks that they have. And roads. And landing at the airport UAON, which I think services the AN-225 and a bunch of other things. There we go. That one was not too hard. And now I have a complicated course to take a look at the Himalayas. As you can see, landing ultimately in Calcutta, really pushing our range there. So this one was a total plot distance of 1,892 nautical miles. Along the way, we see a ridge there and somebody asked me to take a closer look at it. So I dove down that, that sort of geological formation on the right. There we go, that one. So I took a closer look. 
uh, which sort of hurt our fuel situation because we are already pushing the range, but so I was a little bit nervous about the fuel for the rest of the way, but it would turn out all right and we will end up at Calcutta as planned. But yep, skimming this, I thought it'd be fun to just sort of skim it at an angle like this and take a look at the formation. Fairly detailed. This is the only sim that I would expect this area to be so detailed, unless somebody downloaded specific photo scenery for the area. And so here, uh, this is the vicinity of Dera Dune, and this is the source of the Yamuna and Ganges rivers. And so taking a look at all the tributaries flowing together is always fun. Basically, it is the foothills of the Himalayas where everything drains out. And then we'll proceed northeastward to the main part of the Himalayas. Not going to do a full Himalaya tour as part of this video, of course. I've done those before. Uh, so here I'm just showing uh, my attempt to find Lukla in this fog, uh, which was pretty dangerous, to be honest. The valleys are very, very tight. And it was sort of nerve-wracking, but uh, just when we were pointed at Lukla, it turned out that we got below certain clouds, and I was able to spot it. So here I am, gingerly approaching. Oh, there's Lukla! Okay, there's Lukla. <laughs> I was delighted that I didn't kill myself on approach there, but we're not we're landing, not there. landing there. <laughs> we're not landing there, definitely not. Uh, so, we needed to take a look at Mount Everest and verify its height, so that's what we're doing here. I think that's Mount Everest. It's always hard to figure out which one is actually Mount Everest, but I was pretty sure it was this one. I took a few flies around to make sure it was the tallest one in the vicinity. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cause an avalanche. Height checks out. Yep, uh, so broke the sound barrier right over it. Uh, that's the audio effect associated with the sonic boom. And here we are approaching Calcutta. And the landing at Calcutta, I think, was fairly smooth. Was it a little bit side, Oops. a little bit off? Uh, I could have done that better. Yeah, Hawaii definitely should not have been on one around. landing gear. So, on from Calcutta to Hong Kong. And I tried to keep this straight because it was getting late in day two, and I was hoping to make it to Japan by the end of the day. This is Macau here. The flight from Baikonur to Calcutta took 2 hours and 11 minutes. The flight from Calcutta to Hong Kong took 1 hour and 11 minutes. That's so much faster, but we were doing a whole lot more sightseeing on the flight into Calcutta, so that's why it took so long. The distances, this one was just a little bit shorter. Uh, so landing at Hong Kong International. Again, I don't know what the program office is obviously involved in this decision and what they want to do tomorrow. Okay, soft this time for once. And uh, yep, type of next up was reporters. trying to get to Japan. Uh, I overplotted a little uh, bit, uh, uh, especially given the time I had left during the day. The Incidentally, are, we're not really doing a very good job no with problem, getting uh, on time in terms of the audio, meaning that at this point I was almost certainly relative. not going to arrive at Edwards Air Force Base no by the time the shuttle did. And so, yeah. Here I'm taking a look at Hong Kong because on the flight into Hong Kong International, we're on the western side, and so we don't actually fly over the city. And so on the outward bound journey, I flew over the city. And then we tried to take a look at Taiwan, but unfortunately that had serious clouds. Uh, and especially at Taipei, there was just nothing to see. Uh, we just couldn't see the ground. And so here I am at Nagasaki. I wanted to go to Tokyo, but I just didn't have the time. So I opted to just land at Nagasaki, even though that ended up with a shorter flight than I had planned. Only 1,089 nautical miles, one hour. So all together on the first two days, I flew 13,396 nautical miles in 14 hours and 16 minutes. 
average speed uh, 939 knots. Again, thanks to the fact that the afterburner does not consume as much propellant as it probably should. Uh, which I'm thankful for, and please don't change that. <laughs> so, uh, I, I like it. Uh, okay, it is cheaty, but I like it that way. I might, even if they update the plane, keep this version. Uh, yeah, anyway. So, up Japan we have to go, and I decide that it would be possible to land at Kamchatka on this flight. If we... If at Hokkaido we had about 50% fuel we could go on. If by Hokkaido we didn't have 50% fuel, then I'd probably land at Hokkaido just to be safe. And mostly the stuff I take seriously is the fuel management. So, so far we'd be doing okay. But I really should have loaded less fuel on some of the flights. This is a very straight river valley in Shikoku. It ends at Tokushima, that's the city at the mouth of it. And this is Osaka. So, just taking a quick look at the city there. Unfortunately, I didn't have my photogrammetry okay, for Japan here, properly updated, so it wasn't showing any photogrammetry anywhere. Uh, I have since fixed that, but this is Kyoto, and that's the Imperial Palace at Kyoto there, up in front. We'll be with you for five minutes on this pass, and we run in day two or day three timeline today. And uh, that is Nagoya. We noticed that the temperature was way Lots of really big cities in Japan. Very sprawling sort of things. Lots of clouds as we approached Tokyo, which uh, made me worried about the weather. And they blocked the view of Mount Fuji. So only when we got really close to Mount Fuji did we get any any sighting of it. And there it is. Fortunately, at Tokyo, the clouds were clear at lower levels. Unfortunately, uh, the photogrammetry wasn't working. And we're not landing at Tokyo, we're just moving on. And here is the approach at Kamchatka, so... Yeah, Kamchatka is just like St. John's, it's always like this. So, oh, it's there. I totally missed lining up with the runway. It's off to the left there, and this is the worst landing oh, of the whole thing. Interesting. We're really tight on fuel, actually, also. Well, I mean, I think we had enough to go around. But, yeah, this is going to be painful to watch. Ow! 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 Ah, I'm crashing, I'm crashing, I'm crashing. Well, actually, I didn't crash. The game didn't kill me. And it's the game's fault for not killing me, okay? I'm trying to encourage them to increase the base level, realism level. I turned up realism all the way, okay? I'm not, uh, I haven't got any in-game cheats or anything like that. Worst landing ever. And, but, you know, they just have to kill you when, when you blind like that. But anyway, I would prefer explosions too. They just have that stupid black screen. So taking off from Kamchatka, we are on our way to Anchorage in Alaska. Initially planning to land at Anchorage International, but I end up landing at Elmendorf instead. So the shuttle is already on re-entry, I think. Well, preparing for re-entry at this point, and during this flight it re-enters and lands. So I'm running late. Yeah, they're already on final. I'm at least over the United States. Uh, with oh, I'm over Alaska at that point, just barely there. You can see, but yeah, definitely running late on this flight compared to what I had planned. Too much sightseeing. Alright, so the shuttle has landed after the first shuttle mission. There is some post-landing stuff to the audio as they wrap up the mission. But ultimately I have to start STS-7, which is the next flight that Bob Crippen is on. That happened to be... Uh, I had the audio for that because that happened to be the flight that Sal Sally Ride was on as well. As the first woman astronaut for the United States. So, here we go. Landing at Elmendorf. Fun weather as always. 
I really take a long time setting this one down here. Okay. So, there we go. In the snow. Lots of snow. Snow for days. And I try to plot a direct flight to Edwards next. So, it's you can see Edwards is right at the edge of my range. And that is with all the fuel that this can take. And it turns out that it can't, couldn't make that flight. That's just too far. So, yep. We end up having to divert to another airport, which I figured anyway. We have a lot of options. Here's Vancouver that we're flying over. We've got lots of places that we can land to land at as an alternate. And ultimately, I go with just landing at San Francisco International. So, nice view of Vancouver there. And Seattle, or the Seattle area. Not perhaps Thanks the best angle for Seattle there. Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens uh, further forward there. Going at 63,000 feet here. So again, this flight uh, was on day three. Uh, everything beyond Nagasaki was on day three. And basically on day three, all the shuttle was doing was coming back. So it wasn't very good that we had so many flights to complete in order to get back to Edwards. So, the city of San Francisco, I think there was photogrammetry going on around here. And I opted to land at SFO. She will be the fourth person to enter the orbiter after John Fabian. There's ready the audio for STS-7. Both uh, Dr. Fabian and Dr. Ride will be uh, seated on the flight. All right, deck, uh, behind we are uh, down, and Rick Houck, and which the, leaves uh, us with the shortest the flight Pfizer of the whole deal, a 271 nautical mile flight from KSFO to Edwards Air Force Base. And up from SFO. The F-15 is a little bit wobbly on its wheels, but part of the problem is that I'm using a twist rudder on my joystick. I don't have rudder pedals, so that also hurts a little bit as far as takeoff performance. The San Francisco Bay Area. Always a nice view. And we're flying over Moffat there almost. And this is flying into Edwards as we're listening to the launch of STS-7. We've gone for auto sequence start. T minus 25 seconds and counting. The sequencer on board now controlling the final second. T minus 17 seconds and counting. The body flap and speed brake are in launch position. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We go for main engine start. We have main engine start and ignition. And liftoff, liftoff of SCS-7 and America's first woman astronaut. And the shuttle well, there you go. The there you have it. And the thing about Edwards is that people don't understand is how hard it is to see the dirt runways that the shuttle actually lands on. There's that compass there. They're these dirt runways, these are not the one that the shuttle lands on, nor are the paved ones that uh, you see right there that I'm looking at. That's 22 left and 22 right. The shuttle landed on runway 23, which is to my left there. The runway number. And as I said, I can't read the runway number for runway 23. Um, I'll try and land on runway 23 here. Uh, this is for STS-1 they landed on. I think that's 23. <laughs> yeah, it was tough. And so here I am landing on runway 23, which is the one that STS-1 actually landed on. Dynamics reports uh, velocity 23,000 feet. But it is ridiculously to hard to even see it. Being throttled back now to accommodate the G forces before main engine cut off. Okay, that's and it's an awkward taxi back. But anyway, that was the round the world flight. So we didn't land on the exact same runway, but I ran landed in the same location. And here I am coming to a parking. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.